want to talk a little bit about Tocqueville today and about uh, Daniel Allen's, Allen's piece and then we'll move on into liberalism and uh, the, what I've written up there is sort of something that I want to make sure I got out the transformation of values from the old values to the new va democratic values and we'll be talking about that more because today we'll be dealing a lot with the historical development of liberalism out of feudalism um, but first of all turn to Tocqueville Tocqueville, of course, was writing in the uh, early part of the 19th century. He was a visitor from France to America. He came here to observe and he traveled all over the country and uh, observed all the good and the bad, uh, including slavery and uh, church going and just about every aspect of American uh, culture. And he wrote Democracy in America. And that is a big book. Um, some of it so it's redundant in some respects that hardly ever do we teach the whole book um, but it's wonderfully written and it's a description of American culture but its aim is to figure out whether democracy is going to be good for Europe he's reflecting upon how he believes that the American style democracy is coming to Europe and what that means for European culture and at his time um, there's still the vestiges of the old Europe, as the communists called it, as well as the new Europe. He was writing Democracy in America before, the, I think, like 15 years before the Communist Manifesto was written. So there's a period of a lot of change in which you had the old values and the old way of life mixing with the new way of life and even a protest against that. You know, it was the last gasps of European uh, aristocracy. Okay? So uh, this is a great commentary on that transition from the past to the future. Okay, and uh, I just wanted to point your attention to the area where he does most of this contrasting, and he talks about what America loses when it uh, when it rejects the old aristocratic value system in favor of this new bourgeois democratic type of virtue. And you find the, there, there's a listing of these losses on the left-hand side of the page on page 42. Um, and I'm not going to I'm not going to read these all. You've read them, but uh, you'll notice that he attributes to the old, to the past aristocratic culture, all sorts of high and noble qualities, including the idea that the wealthy, the noble, nobles have an obligation to the poor and that the poor have an obligation of loyalty to them and that at least ideally there's this mutual support and that the nobles are admired and um, sort of represent the height of, the, of what the culture can produce. Um, they talk, he talks about how um, there is a sort of law or agreement in the society that is enforced by everyone um, but it's based upon inequality as opposed to equality. It's based on an agreement that inequality is real, that the different classes have different roles to play. Um, and the nobles, he depicts as being, being um, I guess, predisposed towards gentleness precisely because they're in a position that is uncontested. In other words, because they're in a position where their authority is accepted, they are more likely to be gentle, to be uh, to be kind, or at least not cruel, okay? which which is exactly the same thing. He knows, however, that these are ideals that they didn't always exist in Europe, and that, in fact, one of the reasons why even the Europeans are rejecting this old system is because of its flaws, and yet he realizes that the system embodies certain ideals which are lost in the modern world, okay? And uh, so he describes them there. And then he talks about what is gained and what is lost um, at the bottom of the right-hand column and going on up to page 43. And I will read some of this because it's so good. It's so, it's a succinct, very succinct contrast between the old European order and what he sees Americans having and the loss and the gain and uh, we covered a little bit of this before, but um, 
he says, there will be less splendor in the halls of an aristocracy, uh, but the misery will be less frequent. Okay? And that's a trade-off. There's a trade-off. If you have splendor, it's because the very few have a lot of wealth. It's concentrated, and therefore they can afford that splendor in the arts and, and all those wonderful things that we now have in, in museums to admire. Um, but you have more misery because the many are much poorer. That in America you have the wealth spread out much more and uh, you have a growing middle class and that means there will be far fewer people who will have to suffer but you're going to have less splendor. There's going to be less money being poured into these, um, you know, the high culture. The pleasures of enjoyment may be less excessive but those of comfort will be more general. Okay. So he concludes, the nation taken as a whole will be less brilliant, less glorious, and perhaps less strong, but the majority of the citizens will enjoy a greater degree of prosperity, and the people will remain quiet, not because it despairs of amelioration, but because it is conscious of the advantages of its condition. Okay? So the people are quiet, not because, not in the way they were before, where they had no hope of changing the inequality, but they are quiet precisely because there is a rough equality. There is a lot of people um, who have enough property to not wish to change the, anything drastically and not to complain uh, too much. So you see there's a trade-off there. You lose the brilliance and the glory and the, the, the strength in exchange for prosperity and satisfaction. Okay, that's the way Tocqueville saw it. All right. Now, first of all, must there be this trade-off? Do you agree with Tocqueville that there is this trade-off that you have to lose these high uh, things in order to achieve these other things that are spread more evenly across the whole population? Is that a trade-off that uh, that people made in the modern world, in places like America and in uh, Europe and uh, yet there are some things that it had in his view that we don't have and on the whole it's better to be where we're at but nevertheless we lost some things. You mentioned war um, and I don't mean to say that uh, by writing it this way that uh, the trade-off was war or no war uh, because actually democratic countries are just as prone to war as, as any other type of country just about but it's the attitude towards war that changed um, from uh, opportunity for the display of virtue and courage and glory and the sort of glorification of war to one in which war is necessary for the preservation of our society and the goods that we have. Okay? So um, some you know, notice a change in the way that we talk about war from the heroic language and the elevation of the great, you know, the great warrior to the more democratic war. And you know, who fought the war changed drastically over time. The common man fights the wars in the democratic society. Um, and numbers become more important instead of the individual warriors in their, in their skill. And that happens partly due to, to vast changes in technology too, as well as in politics. But that's what I mean by that, that um, democratic societies of the modern times, not of ancient times, okay, uh, tend to downplay the theme of heroism and play up the theme of safety. And again, from Tocqueville's position, that's somewhat of a loss and somewhat of a gain. When you emphasize the value of heroism, you call upon the very best that people can display. The very best that they can display, total self-sacrifice and the desire to, to, uh, to uh, you know, display the best they can be in, a, in this trying situation. But, um, but uh, that very attribute make people go into war for all sorts of bad reasons too. Okay. So anyway, um, there probably is a trade-off. The trade-off is probably real, and of course it depends on each individual how much you think you've lost, how much as a society we've lost. But you're right to point out that in America, we never did follow those old aristocratic virtues very much. There's a little bit of a hangover, but not much. You know, when people came here to this country, they came here for safety, for independence, 
to make some money and so forth. And they left the old noble nobility and that order behind. You know, there never was a nobility like there was in uh, Europe, and he understands that. He thinks that America is going to be successful enough that it's going to nudge Europe in the same direction, uh, along with a lot of other factors going on. All right. Any questions about Tocqueville's commentary? It's sort of a capstone to what we've been talking about for the last week, about the change in virtue. Very good capstone. Does everybody understand his argument, basically? Yeah. One thing I was just a little confused though, when I was reading the textbook, it says that he predicts that because of the fact that it would be a modern society, it would be a real emphasis on fitting in instead of being an individual. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered why, it seems like you kind of missed that whole, it doesn't seem that we're really going that direction. Well, it seems like you're highly realistic and you really do push people who are, who are really incapable of the top of even more modern well, he definitely thought that, that democracy would lead to conformity, like um, that you would have the popular culture would come to dominate. He, he saw individualism more as in terms of the individual expressing himself as excellent, you know, so the excellent ones would rise to the top in an aristocratic setting based upon their, you know, their value and worth and so forth. Whereas in a democracy you'd have people who are um, on average mediocre um, trying to enforce their mediocrity, that they would sort of be anti-excellence, um, okay? Uh, and, and that uh, because they are the influential part of the society, their tastes would prevail and they would tend to be mass tastes. Um, to a certain extent, um, he was wrong uh, because we, you know, we still do have excellence and we still do have um, people rising to the top of their field and also individualism, as you point out, doing lots of things that that uh, strike out on new paths, right? Um, but not totally, you know. The, I don't, did you have something you want to say? Well, yeah, because uh, you just have to look at the horrible, horrible things we as a culture do to anyone who's incredibly intelligent. Mm -hmm. Because we do. I mean, we just, they, in Australia, they call it lopping off the tallest poppy. You know, you want to cut someone down the side. You have you have children who could be absolutely brilliant, you know, children who have genius level intelligence, and you put them in with a bunch of other children, and the other children just attack them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it, it does happen that way. That's how it goes. Uh huh. Well, that's you know, a lot of you folks, you know, going through the public school system probably experienced that sort of thing. Um, still very prevalent today, uh, and in some, in poorer communities even more so, where if you display that you know something, the other kids try to take you down a peg or tease you or harass you and so forth. That is a sort of um, expression of a, a theme that has been constant in our society of anti-intellectualism. Um, yeah. Well, at some level, uh, Toko is very, very right. I would say that in looking at political parties, political system that is involved in America and in Europe, uh, conformity really is, you know, the nature of our political system. When we have two major parties, where as we see in Europe, the evolution of multi-party systems, uh, especially in Germany, uh, to lesser extent in Britain now, nowadays, France. So I, I think in that respect, he, he was correct. Mm -hmm. When you think about our political system. Okay, yeah. Maybe not so much society as a whole. No, then the political system encourages a certain amount of, of conformity. Um, it's, it, it almost is necessary for us to agree with a whole lot of things, or at least support a lot of things that we, we as individuals might disagree with, but we're forced into one, one party or the other. Right? Um, the multi-party system gives people more opportunities for, for their particular preferences. But it, it has its own inefficiencies, trying to get, trying to be effective, you know, getting people to cooperate with each other. But you know, in our culture, which which Tocqueville was just as concerned about, 
uh, he really felt that we could, uh, we had the potentiality for lemming-like behavior. And I guess I would say, you know, as far as uh, you know, what people value in the way of their entertainment, in the way of their, I don't know, music and, and um, what they eat. And, you know, I mean, you see trends. Kind of, I'll give you a good example of this. The, um, the Atkins diet, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's, this shows you how fast these things can develop, okay? One week, you know, I hear about the Atkins diet, low carb. Next week, everything is low carb, including all the menus to the, the mass chain restaurants. They all have a low carb menu, you know? It just totally blanketed the whole country. Now, does, you know, I even had a doctor tell me that the way to lower my triglycerides, which I don't know what they are, is to go low carb. You know, so I'm like, oh, that doesn't seem to make sense. I'm not sure I understand that. And I looked up what, the, you know, and it turns out that is not what you're supposed to do. But she was so, you're, you're actually supposed to cut down on your fat, okay? Um, that, you know, she was so influenced by the trend herself that she just blurted this out, okay? So, and of course the Atkins diet is a commercial thing. You know, somebody's making a lot of money. A lot of people are making a lot of money. And it seems to me that uh, where one of the strongest places that you see the tendency to conformity is in the commercial world. Because if we want to start, or the, the, the people who sell the products want to start these big trends, okay? When everybody's thinking along the same lines. And sometimes it gets to the point where if you question it, you say, yeah, but that actually could make you sick. People look at you like you're insane, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's individualism right beside a lot of conformity. Yeah. I, I would just say that I think one thing that's led to you know just the mass conformity with pop culture is access, mm -hmm. you know, access to the media that we have now that they wouldn't have had like in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you look at Europe, they have just as much trash pop culture as we do. Um, but, then, but then we also have some high culture that not everybody necessarily appreciates or likes or has access to mm -hmm. in the same manner that not everybody would have access to back in Yes. I think Maybe. we have both. Yeah, yeah, and that's due to that we can afford both. You know, that we, 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 we as consumers support the mass culture, and as taxpayers, we support the other culture, at least partly, and then there's the wealthy who support it as well, same as ever, right? So we have both. Um, and of course, you know, one of, the, one of the battles we have is should the taxpayers be paying for the high culture? And we're always, you know, getting into that, that struggle. So far, nothing has really changed, but we've been arguing about it for a long time. Because the high culture still doesn't reflect what most people want to see, let alone what um, most people can see. You know. um, so we've tried, I guess, as a society to still support those things. But you really can't totally match the power of the wealthy class at an earlier era and their ability to support these people directly. Um, most, of, most of how they were supported was through direct sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I think high culture and art for its own sake and learning for its own sake is something that you really miss out on when you don't have an aristocracy because you, everybody in the country has to work for them, you know, mm -hmm. unless you have a huge amount of money. We're pretty much all in the same boat. We all have to make money. And, and art for its own sake does not make money. Mm -hmm. And neither does learning for its own sake. You know, philosophy doesn't make money. I'm seeing that... You know, maybe in a hundred years we won't even study philosophy anymore because right now you study philosophy and if you don't go to law school, all you can do is teach in college. Mm -hmm. And if that's all you can do with it, who's going to want to learn it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're, you know, how did I make this decision? My, my father was a school teacher. We never had a lot of money uh, and I didn't really want a lot of money. I wanted a certain way of life. Um, but I think that the constant drumbeat, of course, is, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be thinking this way, you should be making money, you know. Uh, and maybe you're right, maybe that will become more overwhelming as time goes on. Uh, certainly some of, some of my own family members thought that this was a bad idea, you know. They were afraid that I wouldn't be able to take care of myself. And that hasn't turned out to be a problem. But, uh, you know, why don't you do something more productive, <laughs> was, the, was, was what I heard. So, 
because we're a capitalist, very strongly capitalist society, there's this, you know, the, it seems like sometimes the highest value is making money, and that conditions how we value all the occupations and the different products that people produce and so forth. Yeah. Okay, well, so Tocqueville's at least partly right, I guess. Um, and it's good for us to be able to see the flaws of our culture, okay? I think it's good to be able to see that nothing's perfect, and certainly democracy isn't perfect. Um, and yet there's a lot about it that's good that we wish to preserve. We don't want to you know, go back to the days when somebody else was ruling over us and telling us what we had to say and what we could believe and, and how to worship and so forth. Most of us want to hang on to, to our freedom. And so we have to you know, uh, somehow deal with this and try to preserve what is good while realizing that not everything is, is good. Um, Danielle Allen, Allen's article I wanted to talk about next, Democracy and the Power of Education, sort of gets at some of the things that we, were, that we were talking about. Democracy, of course, has this tendency to devalue education, right? at least not instrumental education. It, it devalues anything other than instrumental education, you know, where you learn something to do something. But yet this woman, Danielle Allen, is... Um, is a professor of ancient philosophy and history, okay? and um, she was invited to the University of Wisconsin Madison to give a lecture on Thucydides, which is something I know a lot about because I wrote a book on Thucydides and um, for my dissertation um, in the Peloponnesian War. Okay, well, she goes there and an event intervenes, 9/11, and uh, she's walking to class and she realizes that this has happened. She hears about this and doesn't know what to do. Um, I remember when this happened. Uh, I remember what I was doing because I was going to class too. Actually, I heard about it uh, maybe like 20 minutes before class was to start at 9.30 that day. And um, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't have this sort of what she describes as stasis or total inaction, but I thought, you know, how can I teach the class today? You know, we don't even know exactly what's going on or, or the impact of it. Um, I didn't think about safety because here we are in Kansas and New York is a long ways away, so I, it wasn't like, I mean, she seemed to think maybe some people worried about whether everybody should even stay on campus, but that didn't occur to me. But I thought, how am I going to teach my students anything uh, today? You know, we can't even really talk about this because there's not enough to know. We don't know anything much. I mean, we know it's happening, but other than that, we don't know. So I decided that I would go tell them that this was happening because some people still wouldn't have known, and then dismiss class. But she decided to go ahead and hold class, okay? I don't know uh, which one of us made the right decision, but uh, you know, I was teaching uh, Gorgias. We were talking about democratic rhetoric. I could have tried really hard to deal with that that day, but that didn't seem like much of a, a thing for me to do. Um, so I told the students to go find some place where they could get the news and keep track of what was happening. Why did uh, Dr. Allen decide to hold class that day? Does anybody remember what she said? Why she finally decided that she had to go and try to talk about these cities? Well, she was she really thought that by not going to class, we get people worried, whereas by delving into cities and talking about things that does, how to react to something like this through that channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. She was concerned that, that she and the class not just sort of wallow in worry and feelings. Okay? Because as she says, people were saying things like, it's unbelievable. I, I can't deal with it. You know, it's too, it's too much. Um, and yet, horrible things have happened in the past, uh, as well as in, in, as in the present. 
and there are ways of dealing with them and it, it's not in her view it wasn't helpful to wallow in emotion okay um, so she wanted to try to find a way to deal with what was happening in a way that would give students the ability to think about it while not um, not being trapped in the indecisiveness or struggle of their emotions okay um, so she actually used the Peloponnesian War to deal with that she said that it gave the class distance so they had distance from the immediate events and they could talk about the same sort of things uh, primarily how a democracy reacts to crises uh, without dealing as much with the present situation although it, talk, it, it sounds like they talked about that too and I'm sure you can imagine how as they're talking about this everybody's thinking about what's going on but sometimes you can think better about what's going on by not directly talking about it okay? so some of the disadvantages democracies have in crisis include people just panicking and not being able to think clearly and then giving up their their authority the authority of the people to somebody who's there waiting to take it okay? and that happened in Athens didn't happen here uh, but it can happen where if a society experiences a great crisis um, a dictator can take over people can just be overwhelmed and, and they're weakened by that uh, being overwhelmed and somebody is there to swoop in and fill that political vacuum um, so that's one good reason to talk about the Peloponnesian War or other instances uh, like that democracies are at their most vulnerable when there is a military crisis you know and especially as in that case where the country itself is directly attacked you know, and where there's insecurity and people don't know exactly what's going on okay so by talking through Thucydides she says um, they were able to stay focused on real questions questions that would become important as Americans tried to actually deal with um, this crisis okay so her conclusion is that she, she says actually she says at the beginning until then she didn't realize how valuable education was for a democracy okay why why is being educated important for being a citizen in her view why is education so important for the preservation of democracy mm -hmm. if you come equipped with an education that's not just uh, say a technical education but you, you've read a lot of history like the Peloponnesian War you know you know about instances that have happened in the past? Mm -hmm. I have read her opinion, but I just assume that it just has something to do with the fact that you're putting government and even the people in the education out of the district, district, the people, mm -hmm. the sister, and the politics, and not have any instances of the population. It helps, especially for people to know something about history, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, if you know history, you can look back at when similar things have happened in the past to get some perspective. Maybe look at instances where cultures have gone through this kind of thing and survived. Mm -hmm. Yes, and if you know that they've survived or that, you know, how other people have dealt with crises, you can think more clearly. You can think more clearly about it. You have more resources to fall back on. If you don't have that, it, it can just very easily overwhelm you, and you have no idea what to do or who to support would be the you know whose ideas to support would be our our primary question yeah governments alone cannot do all the work that they legislate and put into law they need an active working bureaucracy to you know actually execute the functions of government you know the policy and without educated citizenry there's not going to be a working able bureaucracy to support that government mm -hmm. and without educated citizenry uh, you're going to have a lot of special interests that may not be working 
in the best interest of that bureaucracy or the government, mm -hmm. that higher level of education, each aspect of that you know, sort of triangle between special interests and bureaucracy and actual government, uh, you know, it just all works together much, much more with the higher level of education system. Right, and especially those that are actually carrying out the functions of government. But even the average citizen, you know, after 9-11, we were asked as citizens to take our part in dealing with the threat of terrorism. And I think most of us took that fairly seriously, that we had a role to play. And first of all, going about our daily lives. Now, if you're, if you're overwhelmed by the situation, you're overwhelmed with fear, okay, you'll stay at home. And that's going to damage your life and also damage the American economy and, and other people's lives thereby. So, you know, to ask people to actually keep doing what they're already doing, get on that airplane, uh, go to that meeting or conference, business deal, or whatever it is, was asking a lot from people, especially immediately after this, okay? And they needed to have some way of understanding why that's important. Okay? Those who understand the costs of appeasement, of basically running, okay, due to reading history, are going to understand how important it is to stand firm even when you're not, um, when you don't personally feel like doing so. It, it, it's another resource, okay, and a pretty good one for understanding why you need to stay with a particular plan, why you need to remain strong, why you need to retain a certain set of, of values and so forth. So it adds to the people's resilience and to their strength and strength of purpose. Okay? And we have a fairly highly educated society on average if you compare it with many others, um, but not a, not a highly historically educated society, so we probably could work on that. But most of us have some glimmer of knowledge about the history of World War II, uh, which still looms very large in our culture. And you still hear in the rhetoric, the rhetoric of George Bush actually right after 9-11, uh, recall elements of our World War II experience in standing up for the Nazis. Okay. Um, the need to the need to fight evil, which I believe is why he used that term, because we all understand uh, what that means. Okay, so uh, that's why. And she says on um, page 67, it's so important uh, for a democracy. Okay, she says uh, above all, this is on the top left of 67. Above all else, therefore, a democratic education must give citizens enduring habits of reflection and practices of collective conversation hardy enough to generate subtle thought even when individuals trying to think on their own feel overcome. Okay? That's a quality that leaders always have. Okay? Good leaders always have the ability to stay cool and focused even in a crisis. But since in the democracy we all take part in leadership, so to speak, at some level, or should, we all need to have that ability to a certain extent. And that's why, in her view, it's so important. Um, she has a neat uh, definition of citizenship on the other page, on 66. She says, in italics, citizenship is the struggle carried out through conversation to achieve accounts of the world that accord with norms of friendship and provide grounds for action. And I guess that last part of the sentence is probably most important for her point here. Grounds for action. You know, if a democracy is going to act, people have to understand things. They have to be in support because they understand. And if they don't, um, if they're just overwhelmed or panicked, they can't do that. And then the democracy is weakened as a result. Is it the only thing people need? Probably not. Okay. And that, that's the error of a person like Danielle because she, she places such emphasis on learning that she avoids some other sources of strength and resolution that a person can have. But uh, it certainly is important. Okay, are there any questions about Alan's points or anything else anybody wants to say in support or in uh, disagreement? Okay. All right. 
will. Let's talk a little bit about how people have changed over time. We have to go back to European history like I did before, only we'll look at a little bit more detail. Some of the, the trends that happen as Europe transformed from a feudal society into a modern capitalist society. So we're going to be talking about the development of liberalism. Okay. Literally, from Latin, the root means freedom or liberty, freedom. Okay. And so when we use the word liberalism here, we're not talking about left-wingism versus right-wingism. We're talking about a system of thought that supports freedom. Okay? And so we talk about liberal democracy, which is different from the ancient democracy because the ancient democracy didn't necessarily support everybody's freedom. Some people's freedoms were destroyed at the expense of the majority's freedom to do what it wanted to do. But with the development of liberal democracy, you get this notion that everybody's freedom should be protected, even if they're in a small minority. And that, that notion developed over time. Okay? So liberalism is an ideology or a set of ideas that claims universal validity, and that's important to know. Okay? Um, when we get to conservatism, we'll notice that this is one of the biggest objections the conservative bird has to liberalism, is that it claims universality. It claims to be true for everybody, everywhere, regardless of the form of government they currently have, regardless of their culture and their religious beliefs. Okay? And um, you can see, even today, very clearly today, actually, with the particular foreign policy of the Bush administration. Um, the old theme of liberalism coming through. Okay? Because Bush uh, has articulated a fairly clear agenda about democratizing the Middle East. Okay? Now, you couldn't get a place in the world more uh, seemingly disagreeable to democracy okay? uh, for reasons of religion, but just because of past history, um, forms of government they currently have, right, in a lot of cases. So, you know, the belief that these values, you know, that everybody should be free and that everybody has certain rights, is expressed pretty clearly right now in our own government's foreign policy. It's not just for us, it's not just for Europe, it's good for everybody, and if everybody has that, we will be better off, we will be safer, and so forth, okay? But now what I have to do, before looking at the universal claims that liberalism makes, is take you back through history and show you how it did unfold through historical events in a particular place and time. Liberalism isn't just an ideology that comes out of nowhere or is thought of by one person. It's the result of lots of events in European history, which leads some people to question uh, whether liberalism has universal validity. Um, well, Samuel Huntington is a great contemporary example of somebody who uh, disagrees uh, with, with the notion that it has universal validity or has to because it grew up in a particular place in time. It may not be easily transferable to another. Okay? So there's a big debate about this going on. And the people who say liberalism may not be universal, after all, point to the way that it developed in Europe. And they say that the conditions were unique to Europe. Okay? So let's take a look at some of the things that your authors in the textbook mention. Okay? They talk about how liberalism emerges in Europe as a reaction to feudalism and a protest against what they call a scribe status. Okay? And a scribe status is the system of the aristocracy that says that you have a certain place in society and you have it by virtue of your birth. Okay? If you're born into a noble family, you're a noble. And you buy that very uh, you know, thing that you cannot control, 
you will be treated differently. You will be having more privileges and more authority than other people. Okay? Feudalism, then we have to understand more fully. Okay? How did this system of ascribed status develop? All right? Well, feudalism gets its start in Europe after the um, collapse of the Roman Empire. Okay? The Romans held a lot of European territory, but they overextended themselves. Some of you know this story. By the 5th century AD, Roman power in Europe was crumbling. They had been driven back and out by a variety of European tribes, far less civilized than themselves in most cases, uh, maybe less uh, capable of governing, but uh, constantly under attack and unable to always control their internal politics. The Romans had been slowly weakened and pushed out. Okay? In their pl- without them there, there was a political vacuum. There was nothing as organized as the Roman Empire. There were these various tribes. Some of the Romans actually stayed behind. They had developed their own little fiefdoms, their own little kingdoms and territories. And they stayed and further developed them. In a lot of cases, though, the people who filled that gap were tribal chieftains. Okay? So the Visigoths, you know, those old folks, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Saxons, etc. And those chieftains uh, controlled territory, and they did this through um, getting the loyalty of warriors underneath them to help them control the territory. So they were the original princes, and those warriors that were underneath them were the original knights or vassals. Right? And at first the system just very naturally, you know, was, was all about war. Okay? It was about how much strength you had, driving other people out, making sure that everybody in your territory was obedient and expanding their territory. As time went by, the relationship between the chieftain and the the warriors and those underneath them and so forth became more formalized. The Roman culture was not forgotten and their military structure was not completely forgotten and so that had some influence on the way that they developed their own system. So that by about 1000 AD there was a feudal system in Europe which was a sort of fusion of the uh, tribal system with the Roman system. Okay. And there were those called lords and knights, and they held a certain amount of land, and then they had a sort of contractual relationship. It turned, it turned from simply a relationship of loyalty to the chieftain okay, towards more of a contractual relationship between the lord and his knights or vassals, and, and more layers. The lord would have his knights the knights would have their vassals working for them. Okay? And each of them would get something in exchange. The vassals and the knights would get certain amounts of territory that they could control. And on that land were serfs, people without property, people who worked for them okay? and gave up a great deal of what they produced to them in exchange for protection. Okay. Now, all of this sounds rather bad. I don't know if I'd want to live in this type of system unless I was a prince. However, there is something about the feudal system itself which encouraged thoughts of liberty. And that is that not all the power rested in the prince. It was shared. And the nobles, very powerful themselves, were very jealous of their power and didn't want the prince taking too much of it away from them and would even sometimes turn against their prince if it appeared that he was becoming too pushy. Okay? So there was this balancing act of power between the prince and the nobles. Okay? And that experience of demanding something against another person's power, of saying this is what we want, this is what we have, and we're not going to agree with you, is, is a formative influence in European culture. Okay? A great example of this is the, the Magna Carta in 1215. Now we look back at the Magna Carta 
a document from England. And it tends to get taught as some sort of basically democratic document, one of the precursors to the American Constitution, which it is in some ways, but it was a document designed to protect the nobles' privileges against the, against the prince. The prince wasn't to mess with their prerogatives and privileges and treat them arbitrarily. It had nothing to do with the common people. Okay? And it set up a sort of agreement between the prince and, and the nobles. Okay? But that right there is something that you know, taught the people a lesson. If you have property and power in your own right, if you have some independence, you can assert that independence against somebody else, the prince. Okay? And you can make demands on him. And out of that experience comes more and more the formal parliament, the body of, uh, at first, only the nobles that assemble and, you know, claim that they have some right to at least say yes to what the prince does, if not to legislate some things uh, for themselves. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. And the feudal experience is not completely replicated anywhere else in the world. That, that, that is not, I mean, we have the tribal systems in a lot of parts of the world, but they don't develop in the same way and under the same influence as they did in Europe. One of the influences that changed this system in a way that might not happen anywhere else is the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. The church was this universal church, claim to be universal, claim to be over everyone and have the spiritual authority over everyone. And even the, the kings and princes of Europe uh, feared the, the authority of the church. It's spiritual authority, also to a certain extent it's political and military authority at certain times in, in European history. And so the, the Pope, for instance, would have this power to, to try to coerce and force or push uh, you know, members of the nobility to do certain things and not others had influence in matters of their law, their legal system, their foreign policy, okay? who married whom, who inherited property, um, all under the threat of excommunication. So um, that was an influence that doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. And also generally the Christian religion's influence. Okay? Because what the, what the church tried to do elements in the church tried to do over time was to tame these nobles who started out as barbarous chieftains um, with no set moral code into civilized men. Okay? And that is where the code of chivalry came from. The church's attempt to try to civilize these people and the interests of other people, women in particular, in making sure that men were at least marginally civilized. Okay? Self-control. Um, so the code of chivalry came into being side by side with the feudal values of military of prowess and heroism and strength and power. Okay? And exerted some softening influence, more as time went by, obviously at first not very much. Okay? But then by the time of the, say, the, the 14th and 15th century, it, Europe is just full of literature extolling the wonderful virtues of very genteel, uh, chivalrous behavior. Okay? Uh, and, it, and it did have its influence. By the 13th century, we have parliaments, um, bodies representing mainly the nobles and the clergy. The common people were not represented, but more and more the middle class, if there existed one, was represented. So you would get parliaments that included the nobles, the clergy as a separate body, and the bourgeois, the townspeople who owned businesses. And this was the type of um, assembly or parliament that the French had prior to the French Revolution. Most of the time, these parliaments would rubber stamp things. They'd you know, approve whatever the king wanted. And most of the time, those parliaments could only meet if the king called them. Uh, but the fact that they existed was a sort of acknowledgement 
that you needed such a body in order to accomplish things. Okay? To tax people, realistically speaking, you have to have the cooperation of the influential people in society. Lots of times what happened was they all agreed very happily to tax people that weren't like themselves. Okay? So that was always a problem. But, um, but the fact that the parliament existed you know, provided yet a further opportunity later down the road to reform that institution and to make it more democratic. Okay. I'm going to teach for another five minutes because I've got another class to teach at 2.30 for Dr. Richter, but let me just introduce a couple of um, a couple of things that your authors think are important in changing from feudalism to the modern liberal society. The first thing that, that I want to mention they make something of is the plague. The Black Death that occurred during the mid 14th century. Okay? It wiped out an awful lot of people, up to one third of the population. Okay? Horrible catastrophe, but yet it had an effect that lent itself towards more opportunities for ordinary people. Okay. Does anybody recall reading that and exactly why something like the plague would end up loosening up society and providing more opportunities? A leveling factor. A what? A leveling factor, yes. Mm -hmm. Everybody got this disease. It didn't matter whether you were rich or poor. So it struck the rich just as heavily as the poor. And that levels people factually and also in their own minds. You know, if the if the rich are being attacked by this as, as much as the poor, it's it has a psychological effect of saying, well, we're all about equal. You know, we're all equally vulnerable, um, all equally victims or potential victims. Yeah. Would the wealthy a little less vulnerable due to uh, living conditions? Well, slightly less, but not a lot. This was this was carried by rats. And uh, they didn't understand that at this time, but even the wealthy had rats. There, I mean, there just wasn't any place where, where people could be you know, safe from being infected by this since they didn't really understand how to avoid it. Um, but I would say you're probably right. I mean, we don't have lots of detailed information, but I would assume that people who live in squalor would be even more susceptible than not. But the overall effect, though, was pe people from wealthy families would lose all their children, would you know, be quite devastated by this. Yeah. Right. It it opened up all sorts of if you want to call it opportunities, right? All sorts of things needed to be done. More people from that more uh, plentiful class could fill in those positions. So as the society started to recover from that, more of them, you know, who had previously been stuck in, in uh, you know, positions of serfdom, could take over the roles of a merchant. There were there were more opportunities, okay, for people to to do something else with their lives. It's it's ironic. But in every situation where, you know, in the aftermath of a war, when everything's devastated, the average common person, if they're enterprising enough, can find a way to make a living because there's nobody providing anything, okay? So if you have the gumption to go and do it and find a way, you can do it. Nobody's going to stop you as they might stop you if they were at their full strength and organized, okay? So this is, this is why the Black Death... Um, changed the culture of European society. Anything that had that kind of effect would. And then um, the other thing that I'll mention is is just the expansion of trade. And I'm sure that that's much more easy for everybody to understand why that would have a positive effect. Um, partly due to that, but partly also due to the just increasing ability to trade with other countries, better communications and transportation, um, it just was, you know, trade and commerce was growing. And so you had people who, filling in these new roles, would start to make a lot of money and actually become wealthier in some respects than the nobles. 
that really became astounding by the time of the French Revolution. There were nobles who were impoverished and middle-class people who had no noble blood who were wealthy. Because okay, the, no, the nobles' way of making a living was going down. It was mainly agricultural. You know, people and military. You know, they were forcing people to pay up and they were having people work for them on the land. But commerce of the bourgeois, the middle class starting to take over, gave a lot more opportunities for making better money than that. And more people began to move off of that land. Okay? And so you would get this uh, horrible, you know, state, the, the uh, wealthy aristocrat, formerly wealthy aristocrat, still living on his estate, barely eating out a living because nobody is supporting him anymore. Okay? They just started to get left by the wayside. All right? So the bourgeois, what Marx and Engels call the bourgeois, the merchant class, starts to take off. Okay? And once that happens, and the average person, okay, has a has a stake in the society and has an interest in getting educated in order to deal with business. Then you've got this big group of people who's no longer going to stand for serfdom. They're no longer going to stand for being excluded. There's a parliament already in place in most of these countries, and they start looking at that parliament as an opportunity to obtain political uh, influence for themselves. Okay. So when we come back on Thursday, we'll finish up this history. We'll talk about the Protestant Reformation and then look at some of the Hobbes and Locke, early fathers of liberalism.